Nigeria's $150 billion Samoa deal, signed on November 15, 2023 in Samoa, has sparked controversy over alleged clauses promoting LGBTQ rights. The agreement reportedly includes conditions requiring support for LGBTQ rights for financial and other forms of support from advanced countries. Abubakar Atiku Bagudu, Nigeria's Minister of Budget and Economic Planning, confirmed the deal at a European Union reception on July 1. This, his media assistant, Bolaji Adebiyi, clarified that the reference documents pertained strictly to economic development and did not mention LGBTQ issues. Clerics, rights activists and CSOs in Nigeria have expressed outrage over the agreement. Sonny Kowusi from the African Bar Association criticized the deal for threatening Nigeria's sovereignty and cultural values, accusing Nigerian officials of signing the agreement without understanding its implications. The Nigerian Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs and the Abuja Muslim Forum reiterated their opposition to LGBTQ clauses in international agreements. Rabiu Yusuf, chairman of the House Committee on Treaties, Protocols and Agreements, stated that the Samoa Agreement has not been brought before the National Assembly. This controversy comes in the context of Nigeria's 2014 law criminalizing same-sex relationships, highlighting the ongoing sensitivity to LGBTQ issues in the country. Our guest this morning is Dr. Martin Morgan, a public affairs analyst. Good morning, and thanks for joining us, Dr. Martin. Yeah, good morning. Bonjour, bonjour. How are you? Ça va bien? Merci. D'accord. I had to put that bonjour. in there. Okay. Yeah, so, that is great. Yeah. So, um, this Samoa agreement, uh, the <laughs> federal government has denied that it doesn't have any clause about LGBTQ. We already know that the agreement uh, had that clause in it. I don't know if it is possible that they remove the clause only for Nigeria, uh, as the federal government is trying to explain to us. We'd like to hear what you feel about the signing of this agreement in order for us to have the $150 million. Well, uh, my brother, I think uh, we, we have a way of doing some of these things very obscurantic in the type of our own administration. Uh, like uh, you and I know that once you sign an agreement, there are other clauses therein. And when there are these other clauses therein, you should be able to understand that you will be held responsible for any action taken. 403 pages. One hundred and two or three uh, articles and uh, crosses therein. Then somebody is telling you that no, I we sign only to collect the money to develop, but we didn't uh, uh, include other clauses. What else mean? One, we know that uh, some of these uh, protocols or this some of these our diplomat or our common official we do respect to them. They sign some of these documents and protocols without even reading them. That is what I feel, what happened here. It should have been an inadvertently signed without understanding what they are signing for. Because I know that prior to all those agreements, these uh, LGBTQ issues, they have been pushing it forward to Africa. It's another form of European Union trying to impose to Africa. For me, what are my concerns about this agreement? Whether well, uh, is any one it affects our sensibilities it tells you that yes this thing is a threat to our own sovereignty it's treating it's a threat to our own sovereignty in the sense that we will not be able to understand certain arguments we have signed trying to understand the nitty-gritty what are the clauses what are the what in case of arbitrations where do we go what do we accept we should not just say because we need some money for some development then why should Nigeria be an exception if they sign a clause whereby it has to do with the African and Pacific and Caribbean countries? How did you remove your own clause? Nigeria was the 73rd country to sign that agreement in Brussels. And they, so now what happened between, in between the media race? Were they some clause that were a sponge? That is the question they need to answer after all. Two, for me, another level of my understanding my concerns about that, I talk about the sovereignty, is the imposition of the EU agenda on us. 
When I mean that, the EU agenda is trying to impose a lot of it to African countries. I remember very well, almost 33 or 34 countries refuse that type of uh, LGBTQ. It's not part of us. Morally, it's not part of us. In terms of religion, Christian or Muslim, even an ATR, African traditional religion, it doesn't enter our sensibilities. This is where our minister and the protocol or whosoever they are involved in Geneva, Brussels, New York, wherever we have our own diplomatic agency, they need to re-understand and reject that this is what we did. We should affirm that yes, maybe there was an error in between that we were unable to really take it clear so that's why we could not understand. We look at that one, uh, lack of safeguards. If you look at that uh, concerns I have here, it's lack of safeguard. Lack of safeguard in the sense that we have our own cultural and uh, moral values. We are a sovereign country. We have to decide what happened. Already we have a legislation against that type of act. I know that there are some countries that are separate. I live in SA, South Africa. I saw when women and women were getting married. In fact, the first time I saw it in Rosenberg train station, I was taken aback when I saw a lady kissing the other one. I was just taking, I said, well, what happened? Am I number? Is it real? So these are some of these clauses. Our people who are signing the various contracts for us overseas should be able to understand that, yes, you bring the draft. Like the Islamic man said, uh, the council is, I mean, say, the draft they saw is not there. That was, that clause of LGBT was not there. But we are not seeing about the ambivalent situation and the interpretation of section 2.5. Yes, am I right? Yeah, 2.5. Yes, I'm right. 2.5 and section 29.5 of that document. What is the ambiguities in that, that interpretation? Is it an issue of semantic, sexuality, and promote? Do you want them to just uh, promote LGBTQ? No, you're on that current. On some of this agreement, you should be able to understand there's something we call in uh, in the UN, when we, uh, I was there in the system, there's something called PSMAS. PSMAS is a project strategic management attribute. You should be able to understand that, yes, this is what you are going to do. You should be able to, to see it before bringing it to the public domain and append your signature. But like uh, somebody said, they assign this thing in the cozy room of their teas and taking wine. Uh, it reminds me of a story of how the European came in slave trade. They give our elders rum and show them in mirror when they are drunk, and they just say, carry everybody away. I think in this time away, it's becoming a situation whereby what happened in that agreement, this is what happened, that people could not understand. We are undermining the family and the neighborhood values. That agreement is to me is that you undermine the family and the neighborhood value. Those are some of these concerns. And the family freedom, religion freedom is not there. I agree that uh, they want to impose what is good for them, I know that in, uh, some years ago, a year ago, Uganda was banned by the World Bank for setting loan because they refused. I think that was last year, if I yeah, remember. Yeah. It was banned from receiving loan because they couldn't promote that agenda. And it's not part of what. The Amnesty International is telling you that, yes, equality is uh, entrenched in the UN chapter and Africa, uh, in UN uh, uh, chapter and the African charter, equality and right to live. But equality and right to live, there are some sensibilities we need to understand. What is the gram norm of the understanding that affects your peculiarity? These are some of these sensibilities I wish some of our uh, policy leaders should be able to understand. Because it's there, and also it's telling me that there's a lack of clear definitions. The definitions are not there. Because if your government official would tell you, no, it's not like that. It's telling you verbally who and who have seen the document. That's the question we are saying. You can see the draft document, but have you been able to see the last, the, the, the final edition? That was why the people working on the PSAMS have not been able to understand that, yes, this is what it entails when you are signing some protocols to interpret it the way it should be. There's elevation of a non-binding agreement because it's going to be non-binding because, one, non-binding is saying that there are going to be a lot of agitations against certain clauses. They are, they are not been able to tell us that, yes, this is where we are binding. Because in some area, in some countries, for instance, in some countries, this law against negativity is there. Some are enforcing, and some are not even enforcing. I know that some few countries like, uh, like the one in, in, in the Maghreb, it's, it's dead by penalty, it's, it's dead sentence. I know very well, in Mauritania, I've been to Noachok, I work in Mauritania. I know that you don't dare to do that. 
because it's against the, the sensibility and the I don't know which is another word, the poison nature of what it takes. So it's, it's not helping us. They should be able to understand that, yes. And it, it has a lot of unforeseen commitment. What are the unforeseen commitment? We have not been able to analyze that. They should be able to take those are all the pre, uh, precautions we need to take before putting our green. Uh, uh, no, we should not uh, uh, just as a $150 billion as a carrot. We swallow it hook, line, and sinker. And tomorrow, what is the repercussion? We've not been able to do that. And there's a lot of contradiction with our own national positions. Our national position is that there's, we have a legislation for 14 years imprisonment if you get involved. Now, how do we have to define that? We are taking the protocol. So are they expunged? Whereby they say, no, don't promote it. They say sexuality. What is the definition of sexuality? It has a very ambivalent. That is why I use the word ambivalent and ambiguity in the definition of that section 2.5 uh, uh, and Section 29. Yeah, Section 29.5. Because we need to really understand that this is what we need. And it has a lot of coercive measures. The coercive measures here, is it good for us? Those are some of these concerns I have to raise. So if I had the opportunity of asking the minister and the protocol, say, have you been able to understand the, co uh, the coercive measures as involved as EU? So for me, looking at that in generally, the minister has, uh, whosoever the spokesperson has to tell you, no, we don't want. But I believe we have the National Assembly that they will be able to have, the, they, are, they are honorable men and distinguished senators. So in that a combination of these honorable and distinguished people, they should be able to filter and tell us what is good for us and what is not good. We should not allow us to swallow what I think tomorrow will have an impact. Tomorrow, you start seeing young ladies and young boys on the road with the on social media, start agitating uh, naked and uh, brightless and topless and downless. We saw them in UK now recently. We saw them in Finland. So we should be able to understand that, no, those are not part of our values and those are moral. We should be able to understand that, no, we don't have to accept that. For me, passing through the other side of the road to go and sign this, I think maybe the minister was not properly briefed. Now let, yeah, let me let me just let me yes. let me ask this. Um, uh, what is the what is the position of the law regarding signing of these external agreements? You know, does the National Assembly have any input? Because if the minister goes to sign off Nigeria, as it were, uh, in this document or any other document, because we, we know even the aviation minister when he came. He was talking about a certain agreement that uh, the previous minister had with some uh, individuals, some, some interests, and he, he was trying to explain, and every one of us was just like, how did this pass through the fingers of whoever went and signed it? How did he not know? So I'm asking, does the National Assembly have any input into signing of these agreements uh, for taking loans or any other partnership that we uh, enter into. And if that is the case, how did this pass through the National Assembly? Are they in sync? Are they in, in, in bed together and taking this kind of decisions that Nigerians may not even like? Yes, I think uh, for certain reasons, normally the National Assembly, apart from making uh, laws, they still have an aside functions to understand that what comes in through the executive or the minister and the rest. But it's something that there was that harmony and that synergy between this, the legislature and the executive. We should be able to now understand, yes, yeah, they have their own committee, review the draft. The question I keep on asking, like this, uh, the secretary of the Islamic Council say he only saw the draft. Where did he see the, where did he get the draft from? Those are the questions we should know. So when some of these obnoxious things take place, like what you said about the aviation, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Kiyamo, said that there's a certain protocol we don't understand. It's true. It cannot be the business as usual. Most of them may not be aware, officially. Most of them were interested. It's just like the, the crisis we are having in the oil and gas sector now. Some of these things are very obscurantic. I use the word obscurantic because it's opaque for self-interest. So these are where the issue comes to play. We should be able to understand. Maybe, I still repeat, maybe there was an oversight in the part of the minister that they didn't see some of these clauses. They didn't take time to read that document of 400 and Oh, doctor, do doctor, doctor, yes. You're, yes. you're just, you're playing devil's advocate, you know, because I'm sure they know, 
Well, uh, well, let me not say that. But a lot of Nigerians believe that they know what the clauses are. Because what happened in Uganda, uh, they said no to the LGBTQ law and they were denied uh, these things. And a lot of other African countries that have said, uh, we don't want this. Their governments have come out to say, okay, if we don't want this, this is what we are going to meet financially. So how come it's only Nigeria that will have that place expunged from the law? The question now is, are we, are we really, as a country, that desperate that we will accept anything that comes to us uh, because money will be involved? Or is it that the president is playing the script that a lot of people were afraid of, that if he comes into power, because of some of the uh, alleged baggages that he was coming with, he was going to be used as a puppet uh, by Western powers to do what their bidding is? Can you hear me, doctor? Okay, uh, we've lost the audio of uh, Dr. Martin Morgan, a public affairs analyst. We were talking about uh, the Samoa uh, agreement that has been signed by the federal government, which everybody believes has the clauses of uh, the support for LGBTQ community and laws. And we're trying to make sense out of it because the federal government has come out to say that they signed the agreement and there was nothing in the agreement that will talk about the LGBTQ um, thing. And a lot of people don't believe that. How is it possible that for only Nigeria, because every other country that signs it has accepted to, uh, to enforce these laws in their countries? How is it that they removed it for the benefit of only Nigerians? Because in other African countries that they have said no to it, uh, they have they have been told that they cannot access some of the loans that they need to access from the World Bank and from the IMF and from other, other big bodies. So how is it possible that Nigeria either did not see it or those clauses were removed just for the benefit of Nigeria? We find it hard to believe. But we've lost uh, uh, Dr. Martin's connection. We hope that he will rejoin us. But uh, in case he cannot join us, let me just take you back through that story that is uh, uh, making us talk now. We're talking about the Samoa loan. And that Samoa loan, we do hope that uh, it is not going to be uh, what we are thinking is going to be. In fact, we're, we're almost sure that it's going to be what we are thinking that it is going to be. But we hope that the National Assembly and the agitation from the, the, the religious bodies and concerned citizens of Nigeria will make federal government to listen to reason and at least read the document over and see that really it is not including all these things that we are afraid of. Not just read it, let it be public enough for people to read and understand that this is what is happening. Now, the story is that Nigeria's $150 billion Samoa deal signed on November 15, 2023 in Samoa has sparked controversy over alleged clauses promoting LGBTQ rights. The agreement reportedly includes conditions requiring support for LGBTQ rights for financial and other forms of support from advanced countries. Now, Abubakar Atiku Bagudu is Nigeria's Minister of Budget and Economic Plan Planning. He confirmed the deal at a European Union reception on July 1, 2024. His media assistant, Bolaji Debi, clarified that the referenced documents pertained strictly to economic development and did not mention LGBTQ issues. And everybody asks, who reads the fine prints? Some people don't read the fine prints, so they don't even know what the agreements are. It's like, you know, you are, uh, you are downloading an app and they ask you whether you are accepting the terms and conditions. You just go to accept. You don't read it. Maybe that is what is happening here. But the clerics, rights activists and uh, CSOs in Nigeria have expressed outrage over the agreement. Uh, one of them, Sonny Kowusi, uh, from African Bar Association criticized the deal for threatening Nigeria's sovereignty and cultural values, accusing Nigerian officials of signing the agreement without understanding its implication. The Nigerian Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs and the Abuja Muslim Forum reiterated their opposition to LGBTQ clauses in international agreements. Rabiu Yusuf, chairman of the House Committee on Tre uh, treaties, protocols, and agreements stated that the Samoa Agreement has not been brought before the National Assembly 
And this controversy comes in the context of Nigeria's 2014 law criminalizing same-sex relationships, highlighting the ongoing sensitivity to LGBTQ issues in the country. Now, a member of the National Assembly, a chairman of a committee that is over, supposed to oversee these agreements, is saying that this has not br been brought to the National Assembly. So where did they take it to? Who was the stakeholder that was made to look at this document and give some input? Who was it that studied the documents? Was it members of the Bar Association? Was it the, the, the ministers? Was it the... Uh, the clerics, the concerned citizens of Nigeria, who are the stakeholders? Because if an agreement has to be entered into by somebody in Nigeria to affect the rest of Nigeria, stakeholders need to be uh, contacted. Uh, Dr. Martin, thanks for rejoining us. We lost your connection for a moment there, and I, I was just talking yeah. about it. I, I, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I lost. Okay, what I was saying is that uh, you, we are... Uh, so, but the minister is telling you that it's uh, GBTQ. For me, what I'm telling you is that they will just admit there's a total disconnect to, into how this protocol was signed. They were unable to do their uh, uh, project strategic and management attribute as related to that protocol. That is PSMBS. So this is what is affected. Now it has come to the fore. The only thing they have to do at this moment is that we cannot go that way. Uganda refused that, that issue before and they were denied the World Bank. You know, some of these went who institutions, they are not for the interests of Africa. I believe that what is there at stake is that if we don't have any poise communication, is there going to be the later a lot of agitation against this uh, signing of off until that type of thing that is very obnoxious to our sensibilities. The, well, doctor, we are at this point right now. What do we do? Because if these things keep happening. Oh. Uh, for instance, the yacht that we talked no. about, the presidential yacht, that the, we, before it could come to public glare, it has already been paid for. That's what they told us. Even though they began to say they are going to put the 5 billion naira into the uh, loan scheme and all that, but they told us later on that it has already been paid for. So why do these things keep happening? Why do we sell our collective destiny uh, away without being consulted? Why do people do this? Is it because our laws are porous or... What gives right to this? We, you know, we are facing a situation whereby the personalities are stronger than the institutions. And uh, this is why we have some of these uh, challenges that is affecting on certain decision of the collectivity. For me, in that, what the only way out here in this situation is that if they assign this protocol, they should come up with a poised communication. And the National Assembly still have the role to play in this. That, yes, this is what happened, but Maybe we withdraw or we apologize or whatever it is. But the question I still remain there is that it can resent certain protocol. But you and I are not being privy to that document as at this moment. But the only thing they can do that they uh, they have air in terms of uh, in terms of uh, channelization and uh, the policy making on this. For me, there's no amount of conviction going to tell me that uh, we are, we have exposed certain sessions. So it's the communication now, damage repair. We don't want to see our children on the street naked in the name of the LGBT. They're talking about transgender. We never had any transgender in Nigeria yet. We have only cross-dressers. We cannot continue promoting that. So they have to come back and tell the public that they air somewhere. This deal can be rejected. At this moment, we have the right to say no. Because we have been part of it. We have a law in Nigeria that sentenced you 14, 14 years imprisonment. Mm -hmm. we can, this thing can be rejected like what Uganda. Now, Countries uh, are their law. Uganda are their law against some of these things. So why have to put us in the good light? Because some other countries are looking at Nigeria to say to lead the way and say no, let us maintain our moral values. But if this thing has been signed, then it's giving us a lot of not a very good image vis-a-vis -vis our African brother. I'm going to have to be very sincere about that. Okay. So the only way out, we draw the statement. 
give us a poised communication and let us know that yes, he's not as otherwise we're going to have yeah, an agitation of people who are naked and those who are dressed. So <laughs> that would be a problem. Because even in Christianity, Islam, even African traditional religion, even the animals, birds, chicken, you can't see a cock on a cock. So it's not possible. We should not debase our morality to that point. All right. That's so what I'm saying. Okay. Well, that's how it's, uh, it's been, and that's how we're going to wrap it up on this segment. Dr. Martin Morgan, thank you so much for coming on the show this morning. It's a, it's a great pleasure. Apology for the network. This is where we are operating, because this is how the, the whole situation is. Just use the Nigerian and operate it together. Yes, the flood has carried the network. <laughs> we understand. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay, we've been talking with Dr. Martin Morgan, a public affairs analyst. Uh, we're looking at the Samoa Agreement that has been signed by the, um, the country, by Nigeria. And uh, a lot of Nigerians are kicking against it because, first of all, they didn't get to know much about it. And secondly, there are clauses there that um, are insulting to the sensibilities of Nigerians, be it in the ethnic or religious uh, sector or anywhere. It, Nigerians do not support it. Well, we're going to take a short break and up next is that $1.5 billion oil sector divestment deals have been completed. That is according to the federal government. Stay with us.